So colleagues, I'm going to hand over to um, and to our presenter today, Andrea Stare, who is a an English and drama teacher at Stellenbosch High in the Cape Islands. She is currently doing her PhD in technology integration into um, her subject area with a big focus on artificial intelligence as well. And just before I hand over to her, one of the main reasons why we've been wanting to do this for a while is if you've been paying attention to 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 um, news around well news around technology um, over the past year, the whole idea of AI has exploded, and the internet is loaded with lots of people that are talking about AI and 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 are telling you about all these amazing tools that are out there. However, we felt it is incredibly important for us to get a teacher who is actively using these things in a classroom and is actively exploring it from an academic side to talk about what AI in education can do for us um, in our context, in the South African context, and not just talk about all these cool tools that are out there. Just, and um, Andrea is going to explain this in a little bit more detail as the session progresses. This is actually the first episode in a series that we are planning. Um, the, the, the next episodes will only happen in all likelihood next year. But this is the first episode, so keep that in mind as we go through the process, and Andrea is going to unpack that for you as in, in more detail. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Andrea, and, and I'm just as excited as I'm sure everyone else in the session to, to hear what you're going to share with us today. I just needed to unmute my mic there. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I sort of purposefully didn't check how many people are actually in this session, but Yaku mentioned something about 230 or something. I suppose it's a bit more. Um, just to confirm everyone hears me, Yaku, do you hear me clearly? Whilst yes, I'm monologuing. I can hear you clearly <laughs> out there. Thank you. Also, apologies for um, my voice. I'm still a little bit under the weather, but um, <clears throat> and we make the best of this. I'm extremely nervous for today's session, but also equally as excited because I've been in so many braai conversations, uh, staff room conversations, wherever. And the general sort of feeling that I get is people are extremely scared of what's happening in the world. Yes, all sorts of other things, but particularly about artificial intelligence. Um, and my, I don't... I don't, I'm not actually scared of it at all because this whole thing that I want to talk to you about today is the fact that we need to become excited about it. The moment you start becoming scared about all this new technology is the moment that that scary technology actually wins. Um, when you make it the villain, it becomes the villain. So for me, this is about putting on a different pair of glasses and looking at this from with a, with the excitement and uh, oh my word look at all these opportunities that are actually possible now so before we get into anything i would like to play a little game um so i want to find out from you guys and i think yaku you might be able to do a poll or something otherwise it's just sort of in your head which one of these it's a uh, image was generated by ai a or b or c so have a look at them and if you want to, I don't know if there's a poll going on, I can't see the chat. Um, or if you just want to pop the letter into the chat, this is, <laughs> this is not a test. It's just to, to sort of get your brain going. Which one do you think was generated by AI? There Five. is indeed a poll going. So oh, I want to I'll keep you, down. I'll keep you posted on what they <laughs> Well, let's give a countdown, maybe five more seconds. And then you can tell me which one won. is sort of a dominant contender, yeah? Five, four, three, two, one. What do you have going there, Yaku? Sorry, my connection just took a dip. Um, so we've got about 48% right. are saying option A, 37 are saying option B. Uh, now it's gone up to 18% are saying option C, so quite a mixed response. Option A, just under 50%, option B, just under 40%. So they're quite, they're the two most popular picks. Well, the winner is option A. 
I'm always curious to know why people think this is the one. Because Yaku, I played this with him, and he said it's because it's too perfect. And that's actually quite a valid point. But how about this one? So which one of these were generated by AI? Two poems, poem A and poem B. I don't expect you to read the whole thing, but just give it a look. Option A is sort of a Shakespearean vibe, and option B is more of a Rhiney vibe. Any guesses? Do you feel as confident about this choice as you did with the image? I've also Yaku, put out the, the, the <laughs> I've also put out a, 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 a poll. I'm just trying to read it myself first to make a pick. Don't read the whole thing. Read two or three lines um, and then. <laughs> so it's it's neck and neck this time. It's it literally mm. is neck and neck. 50% poem A, 50% poem B. Right. Well, it is poem A. So AI has generated something that could be from Shakespearean literature. And then the last one, which one of these were generated by AI? So I asked AI to write report card comments. Um, something that I've actually used in the past, which we will get to later. But these are, we have three examples here. You can have a look, option A, B, and C. And they all say pretty much the same thing, but just in different words. I'm, I'm trying to keep up with the polls here, and uh, that one's also now up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry, I can't check the chat while I'm on this window, so you are my link to that. No worries. <clears throat> so far, 70% um, of them are saying AI generated option A. Mm -hmm. I think those people have used AI and know how wordy AI likes being. Mm. Not many thing. people think option B has been generated by AI. 9%. It, it's very convincingly for A at the moment. 77% believe A was okay. generated by AI. But this was a trick question. Sorry, peeps, because all of them were generated by AI. <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw one of these in there. The point is, AI is not just one thing. It's not just one platform. It's not just one version of a tool. It's something that is so new and so in its sort of fetal developmental phase that, yes, those of us who have used ChatGPT or Jenny.ai or Perplexity or Llama or whatever, we sort of have an idea about the style that it generates. But the moment you start engaging with it on a different, in a different way and with a different sort of perspective and an angle, then it becomes interesting. And then it starts generating things outside of what you think it's going to generate. Okay, so <laughs> say what now? I had to do that. I'm sorry. Um, so to start with, I think we need to look at where AI comes from, right? So I'm being a teacher here, and I think it's important to have context of this technology in order to understand why is it actually so not just relevant, but incredibly essential that we utilize this groundbreaking technology that will be with us for now and evermore. So here's where I wanna ask Yaku if you can maybe uh, step in here because I attended, now I facilitated a session with Yaku at Face to Face Think Tank and he sort of briefly delved into this and I think he explained it so well that I asked him to just explain it to you wonderful people on this afternoon as well because I think I'll, I'll maybe grab the cat by the tail here. Right. Thanks, um, Andrea. So I remember the story very distinctly when, when I was um, in, still in primary school, uh, a story out of 1995, 1996, where um, they spoke about this computer that was able to play chess to the ability to beat the world's greatest chess player. Um, 
and this was this this was a fascinating thing for me at the time and i just remember that it was a huge huge story um it might be just the context within where i was just kind of surrounded by a brother who was very very much into computers and very very much into chess so he obviously talk, talked about it but i remember this was a this was a, a a big thing at the time and then when i read up about ai when when chat gpt just blew up again the story reminded me um or, or it just reminded me so much of that so when preparing for a, a, a talk on ai um <clears throat> i decided to just go do some research on that again and it came what 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 i found is in 1989 they came up with a tool called or the first the first um artificial intelligence that was actually good at playing chess to the point that it could beat most people it wasn't good enough to beat the best people but it was good enough to beat most people now this was in 1989 they developed this thing it's called deep think um and the reason why chess is so significant is chess is a game of logic but also of creativity you cannot only follow logical pathways in order to beat people in chess there's there's an element of 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 creative problem solving that's involved in it and oftentimes when we when we think of chess we think of something that is really 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 like very very intelligent then deep think it took them a few years it took them six years and if you can yes to no oh, a little bit longer oh yes <laughs> deep blue was and you can go to that one so it took them six years to come up to come up with um deep blue that was able to beat almost everyone and by 1997 a year later it actually got to the point where it was good enough to beat the best chess playing or the grandmaster in the world and this was a big news thing because they were saying like are computers now smarter than people and the answer was well no they were better at playing chess but you couldn't ask deep blue to go and do open heart surgery you couldn't ask deep blue to do a number of different things it was designed to do one thing incredibly well um there was a sense at that time obviously the whole terminator thing you see the image there at the top was this is ai this is skynet it's taking over it's going to come for us but it actually took them remarkably long to get to the point where the next big step was they took on a game called go and go was is is a chinese game that is incredibly incredibly difficult infinitely more complex than chess and they said well if it can master master this then it's officially smarter than us and by 2016 they finally got it right that google came up with alpha go an ai program that was good enough to beat grandmasters at go most of the time not every single time and what i didn't include on this which is a slightly more scary thing actually um to latch onto the whole terminator idea is they came up with a thing called because alpha go was great at playing go but only go a year later they developed a thing called alpha zero which was not only restricted to one system and alpha zero could teach itself and the way that it taught itself was by playing against itself very exciting but what does this mean alpha zero was able to within a few days by playing chess against itself become the best chess playing machine in the world within a few months it actually became better it became a better um it became better at go than alpha go and currently it is completely unbeatable by any other system and it it actually learned not by us teaching it but by it learning from itself so that was a very interesting step but still this did not come up on the radar nearly as big as the deep blue thing came up and i think to a certain extent because i mean great you've got an ai that is playing games really well anyone who plays games on a computer will know you can play against computer ai as well it's not a new thing this thing is just very good at it it hadn't made an impact on us yet but then chat gpt came out and chat gpt kind of revolutionized things and changed things a lot but to a certain extent also not because what it really did is it refocused the conversation on ai a little bit more and and there's going to go on and and talk about the real world use of ai currently that we don't necessarily always think about that is really with us 
and has been with us for a while and you are using actually before we do that and i just want to ask a question uh put put a poll out um just test mm. the response here the poll oh yes we want to change your notion <laughs> of terminator into a friendly robot that you see there so <laughs> just give me a second um I actually wanted to launch this poll quickly, just to see what you have to say about this, Andrea, for your um, convenience. The poll basically says, how often do you use AI in education? Daily, weekly, once or twice or never? Just mm, interesting, interesting question. Mm. We have 400 people in the session by now. Let's see what they have to say. Okay. On this. The responses are coming in thick and fast. We have... 19 people or 20 people who say daily 17 weekly 19 weekly it's growing quickly we have 24 mm -hmm. percent of the people who say once or twice and we have around 20 percent who have never used it in education hmm. and then in the chat we've also got a couple more nevers weeklies dailies it's a very good balance it's almost a 25 percent for each category mm. yeah but this question is also a bit of a trick question because you yep. think it's deliberately using AI, ChatGPT, or any of those platforms, but here comes the clincher. AI is already integrated and has been integrated in many, I want to say most platforms that we actually use every single day. Virtual assistants like Siri, Alexa, and Google uses it to create responses appropriate to the user's requests and instructions. We have it on social media platforms because it, it, the algorithm helps curate the personalized content feeds that we get on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and all of those other social media platforms. We get it in online shopping. So take a lot or Amazon, any sort of e-commerce because it personalizes the product recommendations based on what you viewed and what you bought and what you interacted with. Then we also have it on ride sharing services like Uber and Bolt because it optimizes the routes, it matches the riders with the drivers, and it calculates the fees based on the time of day and also the distances. And then we have the streaming services. So your user preferences are um, analyzed with the AI algorithms so that it can recommend further viewing pleasure content. <laughs> so Yaku's question is actually quite interesting. It's the thing of, oh, now I am using AI. No, you are actually using AI just by YouTubing and just by Googling, because yes, Google also has a certain amount of AI running in the background to personalize, especially when you're signed into your Google account when Googling and it remembers your your data and it it customizes the the browsing experience. Okay. Now <laughs> I, I realized that this term Generation Z might be triggering to many of us older generations like the millennials and the Gen Xs and the baby boomers. I don't know if we have any silent generation people here, but this is a big part of my research that I've done because it's I found it I find it fundamental to understanding why we need to teach the way that we teach and how to optimize the learning experience for our learners. Otherwise, what are we doing? We cannot go into a classroom and teach the way that we would thought. It would fall on deaf ears. And again, what are we doing? We need to progress. We need to grow. So in order to do that, we need to understand this generation in front of us. And just by the way, the next generation is coming into high school next year. That is Generation Alpha. So this presentation will probably be null and void within the next five years. <laughs> so we just need to do this as much as we can. But there's not enough research done yet on Generation Alpha. So they're not going to be that different from Gen Z. Um, but it's just to give you an indication of how one needs to look at the learners sitting in front of us. So this generation was born on to 1995 and this means that they were born into a very tech driven society technological communication or tech driven communication is not an option or a luxury for them it is it is literally the same thing as speaking to someone face to face we see it as oh put your phone away speak to someone face to face 
they see it as one and the same thing. They have seamlessly integrated the digital and the natural worlds. These, okay, so I read this article on fortune.com uh, in the past week or two, and it said that the, this generation spends an equivalent of a 40 hour work week on their devices, whatever device, a cell phone, a tablet, a, a, a laptop, uh, whatever it is. And don't think that they just spend it on a single device. They will watch TV while they're on their phone and also, I don't know, playing a Xbox thing in that background as well. They are on multiple devices at the same time because they are adept at multitasking. They learn very fast and they respond to visual information extremely effectively. This does not mean that they remember very well. Research has been done to, that indicates that their ability to remember, literally the, the, the way that their neural pathways are formed is different because they don't need to retain information like we did. I remember memorizing maps <laughs> when my family went on holiday trips. They don't need to do that now. You open your app, boom, you don't need to remember where you just came from, that you just use your phone again. So it is different, it doesn't make it bad it's just different and that's i think the big shift the perspective shift that we need to um uh, activate so gen z is also known as the digital natives this is a term coined by a researcher called mark premsky and i find this term to be quite interesting because this stands in contrast with digital immigrants which for all intents and purposes millennials and uh, Gen X and baby boomers and silent generation, we are all digital immigrants. We grew up in a world without all of this digital uh, uh, support systems, digital technology, and we immigrated into the world of digital tech. These kids were born into it. They are native to this world. They are fluent in the language of anything, computer, video games, internet, digital, digital technology. Um, they use technology extensively for hours on end, not as a luxury, but as an absolute necessity. And it's part of the, the way that they, in, that they interact with the world. Again, they multitask. They are not just adept at expressing themselves to digital media. It is essential for their individuation and their identity in order to, to express themselves using a multimodal um, uh, way of looking at the world through Instagram, through photos, through TikToks, anything with a filter, music. Um, they process information very fast. They prefer to work in collaborative environments because of this thing of instant feedback. You can imagine now you post a, f a photo to Instagram, like, 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 or uh, cancel culture and all those things. But the point is they get instant feedback. It's right there at their fingertips. And again, the preference for visuals. They prefer graphics and they value visual communication. So before I get into the next thing, I just want to ask Yaku to interject here, please. And just from your perspective um, as a, you're not an e-learning advisor, I can't remember your title now, you're high up. <laughs> just explain the South African context, because obviously this, what I've been talking about now is a sort of a world context and our South African context might differ a little bit. We just want to bring that into perspective for the attendees of this webinar. So, Yaku? Thanks, thanks um, Andrea. I think one of, the, one of the things we can often, one of the mistakes we can often make at this point is when you read all of this, we can say, yes, this might apply to our more affluent communities and yes, um this this is based on 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 research in first world countries and while that is true we also have to be mindful of the fact that south africa is also in terms of of mobile devices more flushed with 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 devices than any other first world country in the world we actually have more device mobile devices when you have a look at the device to person ratio it's more than one to one in in favor of the devices in fact so we we have to be aware of that. And we also have to be aware of the fact that access to internet is rapidly spreading throughout the country. It's not 
it's 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 not where we want it to be. But just think five years ago, think ten years ago, think fifteen years ago, and then you imagine at the same time what would it look like in five years' time. So we have to be mindful of the fact that a lot of these things might seem like it doesn't apply in our context, but it is either already here or it is definitely coming. Um, our director in e-learning, he, he likes to say that what's happening now is slowly but surely, just like water and electricity are absolute necessities, connectivity is starting to join that. Water, electricity, connectivity, these are starting to become essential cornerstones for, for, our successful, for, for successfully navigating the world. Um, and while sometimes it doesn't feel like it, it is changing around us. And the whole point of talking about these, the, the, the Gen Z generation is to try and realize that we have to change our way of thinking about how they're accessing and working through content. I had an interesting conversation with, 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 one, of our, um, with, with one of our subject advisors a while ago where they said, but... And kids don't have tablets. They can't write. They can't write um, longer responses on tablets. When I was still in school, um, when I was still teaching about five five years or so back, the kids were writing 500 word essays on a cell phone. I would never want to do that, but that's because I'm a digital immigrant. That to me is a weird concept. Why would I want to write on a phone with two thumbs, write an essay? But they're digital natives. They grew up with that. They look at you and they say, but why not? Why wouldn't you want to do that? We have to start changing our, our view on those things. And this concept to me is such a powerful concept, the idea of a digital native and a digital immigrant and the difference that that brings in how we approach technology. Absolutely. What that sort of uh, spills into is the idea of digital wisdom. Um, so I love the term wisdom because it's not just about knowing something. It's about manipulating, manipulating what you know and, and making it your own and applying it to real world context. So two terms, the one is digital literacy. So it's the same as conventional literacy where you are able to read and write and interact with information in a certain uh, modality, but digital literacy also involves understanding how to use information from various digital sources and then to critically evaluate those digital sources and construct new knowledge from this. But above and beyond this, more holistically, is digital wisdom. So you, Yaku and I had this conversation, I think two days ago, the idea that you can be you can be digitally literate, but not necessarily wise but you can't be digitally wise without being digitally literate i hope that sort of makes sense the one does lead to the other one the moment you understand how knowledge is disseminated in so many modalities then you can start making decisions using that technology and 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 use the technology to actually uh, affect how you make those decisions because for me, it's two different things. And then you start becoming creative with your solutions and you can consider complex problems in a different way because you're aided by technology, something that 10, 20, 30 years ago was not possible at all. So going through and going into AI and the conversations and the world that lies before us, that we should decide either we will explore this with gusto or we're going to squirm away in fear i think it's important to understand this concept of digital wisdom not just for ourselves but also instill this into our learners because i think if teachers start going mm -mm, AI, pfft, no, no, nah, and go back to pen and paper that is not training is the wrong word that is not growing our learners it's not creating a, a effective contributors to the future workforce. It's not enabling our learners to become strong, lifelong learners for the rest of their lives. It is just you trying to put a plaster over something that is just annoying at the moment and tricky. So how is AI text generated? 
right? So you go to Google, you type in something, boom, 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 it gives you a bunch of results. You might think AI works like this. It does not. AI text is generated on the go. So it is literally word for word being generated and it is based on the previous word that it generated. So let me explain. It has the ability to understand context and we will get to this notion of context and then provide relevant responses based on that context. I cannot emphasize this enough, that idea of context, but again, I will get to that in a bit. It allows you to have human-like conversation. So this is where it's different from Google. Google, you go, give me this information. It gives you that information. And now you have to suss out what's sort of valid and what's not. With AI, it is an interaction. It is a reiterative process, an ongoing thing. And then this is what I mean by it predicts and it bases it, its response word for word on the previous word. It predicts what words, phrases, and sentences are most associated with the input. I'll explain a bit more. So if I type in quantum mechanics is, <clears throat> excuse me, quantum mechanics is, then the AI algorithm goes, okay, so the probability of the next word being A is 4.5%, or quantum mechanics is, the probability of the next word being based is 3.8%. And then it generates the, respond, the, the response word for word based on that probability and based on the context that you give it. I'll show you some examples in a little bit. So this is a, sort of an example of how it, how it can go. Quantum mechanics is fundamentally then it runs the algorithm, probability rate and everything, and it goes quantum mechanics is fundamentally a, uh, and then quantum mechanics is fundamentally a uh, probabilistic, oh, tricky word. And so it generates it bit by bit. It asks itself, given the text so far, what should the next word be? And this is trained on whew, data that I can't even fathom, billions and billions of data bits. Um, so it's not, exactly like Google yet. You cannot get up to date as in news that happened yesterday. You don't have access to that yet. I think it was trained up until 2021, September. So you can ask AI and specifically ChatGPT stuff about news up until then, but you can't ask it like what happened yesterday in, I don't know, uh, uh, Canada. It will lie to you. Uh, and then ChatGPT is choosing the best response step by step. Um, and now they, we're getting to our next bit. So yeah. there's one important thing that you that you mentioned there. If you ask ChatGPT what happened yesterday, it will give you a response. And I know you're going to touch on that later, but I think yes. it's an important thing to take note of. It will give it you will a response. Be, uh, it will tell you what happened yesterday. <laughs> it will well, lie we'll, to we'll you. get to that later, yes. <laughs> okay. Because it always wants to look smart. That's the thing. So... Before we get into chat GPT, because this is what we're going to focus on for this session, Yaku and I are in the process of um, probably developing some other shorter sessions, for different tools, but this is now just to address the elephant in the room, which is chat GPT. So we'll focus on that for today. And also something that Yaku uh, asked me to mention is because of open AI and GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 and everything coming out and all of these large language, large language models, um, a lot of startup companies also want to cash in on this. Um, and they are developing smaller tools and niche tools that can develop your lessons and they can, I don't know, write emails for you and all of this. Just be aware that you can get away with most things uh, for free. You don't have to pay for these fancy tools. If you go, for example, to ChatGPT and utilize it the way that I will show you some examples now and just play around with it, you do not have to pay for any of these other tools. It's just people obviously want to enter the market and want to try things, but it is not necessary to pay. Yes, you can get a paid version of ChatGPT as well, it's not necessary. Yaku, do you want to say something on that? Yes, I think we need to be, we, we, we also have to understand we live in a world that is driven by capitalism and also, unfortunately, greed is a big factor. 
So a lot of what you see happening in the AI world, especially in the educational technology thing is, everyone is giving you a sample of what it can do for free. Um, especially these new pop-up tools. They're giving you these incredible tools that are great. You use it once or twice, you get very excited about what it can do. And then they start asking you to pay for it. And often they ask you to pay for the, to edit the things that you've already made. So I think mm -hmm. you need to be yeah. careful whenever, this is a, this is just a little bit of advice that I can give you. The very first thing I do when I open up any new tool is I look for a tab called pricing and I click on that and I find out, so what do I get on the free version before I invest time and energy into this thing? Um, so that I know that the, the, the time I've spent to learn this tool is time well spent. If I see that I'm not going to get enough value out of this thing for free, it's going to ask me to pay for it. Um, and I'm not saying you shouldn't pay for tools, not, not by any means, but you should have enough value out of it for free so that you can make a good informed decision about paying for it and be aware of the cost implication up front. I think that's an important, yeah. just an important tip. I think it's a very good tip, by the way, because the examples that I want to show you with ChatGPT when we get there, I think when you start playing around with that, you'll see you don't really need that much more. Okay, so ChatGPT, like Google, but not. I've sort of spoken about that example. It types stuff in like Google, but it does not respond like Google. If you start seeing ChatGPT as a friend, a classmate, a colleague, or whatever, and you start brainstorming ideas with it, that's when the change happens. So ask yourself, how would you use your friend, your classmate, your colleague, and talk about things and brainstorm things that's when that reiterative conversation starts happening and you start replying to feedback and adjusting prompts. And that's when it becomes absolutely fascinating to play around with. But there are some limitations, just like a human, a friend, a classmate and a colleague. It hallucinates facts. In other words, it will lie to you and it will lie very, very convincingly. It will tell you exactly what happened yesterday in Canada and you will start believing it. So please check your facts. It is actually quite incredible how well this thing lies about facts. Obviously, it doesn't want to lie. Um, <laughs> I think it's sometimes like a human being that thinks they're telling the truth. They're convinced they're telling the truth. But um, it does hallucinate these facts to sort of strengthen its communication with you. And then it doesn't always understand what you're talking about, just like a human being. So sometimes you need to clarify what you were saying. Um, and that's about also giving context to what you're busy with. So just to show you when you have a ChatGPT link, I'm not going to post it now. I'll post it a bit later just so that you know, this is what the landing page looks like. And then when you go down here to try chat, chat GPT, this window pops up. And this is where you type your stuff in. And I had some old conversations. It automatically titles the conversations of any new chat. And that's where you're going to type it in. But we will get to that a little bit later. <laughs> Prompting is king. Yaku told me to take this bit out, but this is my own personal Easter egg. I want it in here because. I think, okay, like Hamlet said, the prompt, the king, whether in I'll catch the conscience of the AI, I could not find something to match king. But the point is, this is the most important thing you need to understand when working with AI, the prompt. That is how you start interacting with AI, how you start manipulating it, how you start to really utilize the power of AI is that prompt. So I like my Easter egg from Hamlet here. Mm -hmm. Thank God. So some examples and ideas, I'm gonna walk this through with you. The first one we're gonna do is we're gonna write a story. We're gonna um, adjust Andrea? some prompts. Yes, sir. I just thought I'd interrupt you quickly there because there's a mm. there's a, a conversation happening in the chat regarding um, the the up to dateness and the lies etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Just to just to kind of um, explain that quickly, 
the obviously the AI systems have have guardrails built into it. So if you're going to ask ChatGPT what happened yesterday, it will come up with a generic response telling you, sorry, mm -hmm. I only have data sets up to X, Y, and Z. But if you ask it, for example, how many Rugby World Cups have South Africa won, it will tell you three. It will disregard the fourth one, which happened too recently. Something like mm -hmm. BARD, which is also a large language model, works in the same way that ChatGPT does, is is more recent because it's actually plugged into the internet and it harvests current data sets. So it is, it knows, well, it might not know what happened yesterday because it still has to process these things, but it is a lot more up to date. I know someone mentioned perplexity. I haven't really used perplexity. I don't know if you know how recent yeah. perplexity is or. Um, I actually don't know about the database it's, it's trained on, but I'll, I'll actually look into that at some point. Because it should be up to date. I think chat yeah. is the, the the least up to date because of the, the other capabilities it has. Yes. So this is the thing. What you have to understand There's a reason why we are still talking about chat GPT and not necessarily the others. And by no means you should not explore the others. They're also great. But mm -hmm. chat GPT, I've found with a lot of things, is just simply a little bit. Well, it depends. Each tool has its own strengths and its own weaknesses. But chat GPT is also the thing that blew up the conversation. So I think it is well worth looking at what, why, why is it like it is? And um, what's the reason why people, it is still by far and away the most used of the AI tools when compared to BARD and perplexity and all those things. And it's also got by far the most people that are connecting to its API and using it, et cetera, et cetera. So there is value in that. There's, there's a reason for that. Absolutely. Okay. So some examples of writing a story, and we're going to adjust some prompts. I'm going to look at some summaries that you can generate. We're going to set some multiple choice quizzes, some lesson planning, uh, some to improve some of our writing, uh, generate some report cards, and also write some emails. So off we go. I'm going to open ChatGPT. Yaku, can you see this window? I hope so. Yes, I can. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, so I'm in my chat GPT. Just want to get my prompt. The first one we're going to do is just do this. I'm not going to type everything live, by the way, because then you're going to see how long my fingers are, how clumsy they are. So I've already written my prompts and I'm just copying and pasting them. So there we go. That's my prompt. Write the story. Write a fact. Oh, is ChatGPT going to be slow on me now? So this is also what happens if um, you don't pay for it, then sometimes it's a little bit slower. I'm just going to refresh it. If you pay for it, you're sort of high on the priority list, and then it writes your stuff a bit faster. Yep, I am seeing it. Okay, fantastic. I just want to swap some things around here. Okay, so let's try it again. I have a very simple prompt here. Write a story about a fox. And it takes a minute. So I like BARD, but I'm, I like it for certain things. So the moment you start working with AI, you can start sort of uh, associating certain platforms with certain functions. Um, so I haven't tested these prompts on this platform, but it should pretty much be the same. I asked it to write a story about a fox. Here we go. It's a whole story. In the heart of a sprawling forest where sunlight danced upon emerald leaves, blah, 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 blah. But what happens if I change my prompt and give it some context? So I've copied and pasted a prompt that I've typed before. And this prompt, instead of saying, write a story about a fox, I'm saying, I'm a high school teacher and I need to set a comprehension test about a fox going on an adventure. The story should include a unicorn who always gets into trouble and the story should be set in Australia. Write a story of 150 to 200 words. Let's see what it does with that. I'm trying to give it some context and guide it towards writing something that is applicable to my needs. Oh, we have a picture. Okay. It's Australian fox. Once upon a time in the heart of the Australian outback. Fantastic. So it's taken my context into consideration. One day, Finley and Pip decided to go on an adventure. They packed the backpacks, blah, blah, blah. Oh, another picture. <laughs> so it has changed. I still wanted a story about a fox, but I just gave it some more information. Okay. Yaku, you are more than welcome to interrupt me anytime that you find appropriate or that you want to say something. 
I'm going to open a new chat because now it's about actually adjusting uh, prompts. So let's say I'm a learner or whatever, and I do not understand this concept of osmosis. I'm an adult and I still don't. Explain osmosis. Fantastic. No, man, explain to me. Go. Hello again. Mm. Why do you do this? It's incredible that these things happen when 400 people are watching you. It's really weird. <laughs> okay. So explain osmosis. It's a fundamental process in biology, blah, 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 stuff I don't understand. Fantastic. But if I change the context, again, I just gave it some instructions now. Explain this thing to me. But if I say, explain it to me like I am a biochemistry major, I'm hoping this point will then give some sort of more detailed um, jargon. If it takes it, there we go. And it changes the output a little bit. Something went wrong. Sorry, BARD is still experimental. Oh, okay. Don't go wrong. Okay, it's still not giving me the response. Yaku, can you help my train smash, please? <laughs> <laughs> I have no this idea why. I, I, <laughs> it is really, it's a case of there's a lot of people that are now. Um, oh, my word. Let's try this. That are, that are now on the network. It, I, I think it's, it is, as, as someone has pointed out, I mean, jokingly, um, America yeah. has just woken up. It's but waking up, yeah. You have to understand what, what's also happening is a lot of people are using these prompt tools for writing emails. So typically people arrive at work, they've got a whole bunch of emails, they need to respond to it. AI needs to write all of it now for us. Um, yeah. So what I can do is I can I can talk you through the thought process of how you can I develop these prompts for this session, because obviously the ideal is to show you the difference that this makes. But if you watch the recording of these of the session and you actually go and test the different uh, the different, different uh, sets of prompts and the variations within it, and you see what sort of feedback you get. For me, it's about your computer is not going to explode, right? It's not like the Windows 95 computer you had in your mom's uh, living room, where that thing where you look at it too long, you know, it's, it catches fire. For us now, these platforms are so open to play around with. Just go, sit down, grab a cup of coffee, clearly not at four in the afternoon, maybe at another time of the day, and then go and play around with it. So if you want to try and adjust your prompts, you just make this a bit bigger. So let's say explain osmosis and then tell it you're a biochemistry major or you are six years old. You can already see the difference that you'll have between those two outputs. The one is an expert and the other one has just learned how to walk. I don't know children. Uh, explain it to me in the persona of Snoop Dogg. We just start playing around with this. It's really funny. So the especially ChatGPT, it, it has it has the ability to speak to you in various personas. So I, I wanted to put you put your Nicki Minaj, and then I remembered. Oh no, I can't. Like principals will be attending the session. But if you say Snoop Dogg or Barack Obama or Nelson Mandela, and it speaks to you in that persona, and it also gives you that perspective from that perceived persona. And then also you can try it in a different language. So the thing here is though, um, and Yaku corrected me on this, just be, it, so the language model probably knows so, not easy um, So you might just need to adapt your prompt and, and sort of different variations of it. Um, because I think internationally it's it's known as COSA and not easy COSA. Okay, and then I have this massively long thing that I copied from, oh, I actually don't know which website I copied this from. It's a summary of one, I think, of one of the acts of Macbeth, or is it the full Macbeth? 
And my instruction is to AI, summarize this in 10 bullet points. So immediately you can sort of start seeing the value in revision for your classes as well. So instead of giving your kids this whole long thing and go, okay, that's the revision, just read that thing, I'll give you about like five hours to finish that. You can just bullet point it for them or they can bullet point it for themselves and it's sort of a study platform uh, that they can use to prepare for a test or an assignment or whatever it is. But where I really got my first real kick using AI to help me as a teacher was I was setting a language test, uh, actually coincidentally for my grade 11's uh, FAL class. And I needed a text that I can put into paper one for a summary because I had a theme for my question paper and I couldn't find something, a text that will link to the theme I was working with with the whole question paper um, for the summary. And I asked it to generate a text about the health benefits of exercising. And I told it it should be between 100, 200, 150 and 200 words. And it gave me this text. Sure, it wasn't the best text. It was definitely usable, but I had to simplify some words because it's for FAL and not home language. And then I asked it, summarize that text that they generated, summarize it in seven bullet points. And each bullet point should be no more than 10 words. In other words, there you have your memo for that question paper. I do, however, just need to mention, if you are setting question papers, I think this is applicable to any question paper, and you add a text or a source from somewhere, you need to reference it. You just need to say where it's from. When you do add a source from AI, that's AI generated, please remember to just say generated by ChatGPT or generated by Googlebot. It's just um, uh, ethical to do that. And it's something that we need to teach our learners as well. Sure, they're going to use it, but it's that whole gray area now between plagiarism and your own work. Because plagiarism, black and white, you stole these words from someone else. So I'm one, meaning some person. But AI is not a person. It's not someone but it is also not your own words. So it's a it's an ethical gray space at the moment. Um, and I know that um, academic genius is somewhere up in clouds. I don't know where they are. They are trying to pinpoint how do you measure the extent of it being your own work and it being generated by, it was the content was generated by AI, too much of it. Um, so I think it's important for us to show by example that when you do generate some content using AI, that you reference it just to say that this is not your own work. Yaku, would you like to weigh in here? While I sneaky take a sip of water. So so the whole the whole plagiarism generating content thing, it's it's going to be, and unfortunately it's going to be murky waters now for, for the next while. Um, because just as you've got tools that are able to generate text for you, like ChatGPT, Bard, all the different ones that you've that you've mentioned, there are also tools out there that can try to detect whether or not something has been um, generated by AI, whether or not it's your own work. So Mm -hmm. These tools are developing at the same time, and because they're developing at the same time, which is kind of interesting, the the it's almost as if they're trying to be one step ahead of each other the whole time. Because one of the things that I found most interesting in in I didn't realize that the, when when I started using ChatGPT, and it's unfortunate that we can't show this to you now. When I started using ChatGPT the first time around, I literally used it like I would use Google. I would give it one instruction, mm -hmm. it would give me a response, and I would use that response. And I was happy with that. And the more I started thinking about this notion that Andrea's talking about, that it is you should talk to it the way that you would talk to a friend who you're asking to assist you, the more I started trying it and the more it started making a difference. 
So by now, if my instruction is, um, my instruction in the past would have been um, create a summary on, what's this one again? Uh, on uh, the benefits the of exercising. Benefits, I would have yeah. just said that. Create a summary on the benefits of exercising. The minute that you give it more context, it starts doing a better job of knowing who, what you want. And it comes back to that making choices in the next word that's be going to be put in there. Because all the context that it is given is added into the large language model to make more accurate predictions on what would be the next, what would be the, the, the appropriate word. So if you tell it grade 11, then it knows something. If you tell it English additional language, then it knows something. If you tell it make it this length, then it knows that. The more information you can feed it to tell it what you want, the better. And what's, what, what I enjoy most about the thing is then responding to the answers that it's given you. If it has generated that summary for you and you don't like it, you feel it is a bit too simplistic, then you can literally tell it. Um, use higher vocabulary, use less, use more simplistic vocabulary, or use use longer sentences. You can literally ask it, write me a write me a paragraph and include grammatical errors if you need to use that for whatever reason. Yeah. But actually talking to it and and communicating with it in a way that it is responding to you is how you're going to get the best information out of it. So I just want to uh, hook on to what Yaku said about the AI detection tools. Um, word to the wise that apparently I write like AI because most AI detection tools that I put my own writing that I 100% wrote myself says that it is a high probability that AI wrote this. So those tools are not um, very reliable, although I highly doubt that a grade 8 child learner will write like I would write something because I'm old and useless. But the, the point is we cannot trust those tools 100% yet. They are still in development and sort of uh, very much at the beginning phase of becoming something that we could trust 100%. Okay. So the next one I wanted to show you is the setting of multiple choice questions. So if you use a reference like Macbeth, Act 1, Scene 1 to 4, this is something that a large language model would know. It is in the uh, the great uh, oeuvre of literature, and it has a reference to it. But if you say, you know what, um, I'm doing a poem about, uh, or that Kurs Kumbais wrote, or André Letoir, I highly doubt that it will know what it's talking about. I tested it with Sophia Town, a, a South African text from the 1970s. It does not know what it's talking about. It, it tries to convince you that it knows the characters, but it does not. But something like this is international and you will be able to use this and set 12 multiple choice questions and provide a memo. So, uh, so the the language teachers out there, or well, actually all teachers, you know how tricky it is to set multiple choice questions, purely because of all the wrong answers you have to give. Um, it's fine giving the correct answer, but then you have to make up three other answers that are not correct. And here you go. This is just, if you just want an exit ticket for your class or a little formative assessment activity, here you go. You can just set it to this, uh, set some multiple choice questions and then export it to some other platform, uh, a gamification thing like Kahoot or Quizzes or um, Quizlet or something like that. And you don't have to sit for hours and uh, write it yourself. Some lesson planning ideas. Again, here we go to the idea of using it as a brainstorming partner. So the prompt that I've developed here was I'm a new high school teacher and I've never taught figures of speech. I need to teach three lessons to grade nine learners. Each lesson, lesson, lesson should be 45 minutes. Design three lesson plans for me. Provide details for everything I need to discuss. I have a data projector and internet connectivity, but no learner devices. Context. This gives context, the fact that you have a data projector, you have the internet, you have grade nine learners, um, you are a new teacher, the lessons, lessons should be 45 minutes long. 
three lessons. So it's an overarching goal that you are trying to achieve. All of these, uh, all of this information provides context for what you're looking for. And this is now when ChatGPT will give you some ideas and then you can go, okay, hang on. Lesson 2.5, elaborate on this. What sort of exercises or activities can I use to um, explore metaphors or uh, whatever it is or similes? So then you can go further and say the third lesson will take place in a computer lab. So more context. Rewrite this to make the best use of computers for transformative learning experiences. So you are now instructing it to delve deeper into um, content creation and generating ideas as to how you can engage your learners in your specific context. And Andrea, baseline thing. Yeah. Andrea, just, just with regards to specifics, someone just also mentioned here in the chat that um, it's also helpful to add the term CAPS and WCED oh. to your prompt because this is part of the data set that exists within the, the large language models because then it will, I'm assuming it knows CAPS and I'm assuming it knows where what WCED stands for. So, um, yes, it's yes. all it's all about those. And and I, I specifically um, asked Andrea to add this this additional prompt to the lesson planning because even if you've got a lesson plan that you're using, so it's incredibly useful. The first example that she shows is incredibly useful for a new teacher who is not quite who hasn't quite come to grips with all these things yet. But a question as um, within within e-learning that we are often faced with is like, okay, cool. How do I actually use Technology. What do I do? Give me an idea. And I think one of the most useful things that AI does for us is not necessarily doing our work for us, but prompting us to come up with ideas. So it's kind of a, we prompt AI, give me an idea. It gives you an idea. The challenge is just then now comes the human creativity element that it might not have and to realize, okay, this is a cool idea. However, in my context, I need to adapt it in X, Y, and Z, but it, so it does some of the work for us, but it doesn't do all the work for us. And that's the mm. valuable part that you have to understand. We prompt it just so that it can prompt us effectively. Absolutely, that's such a nice way of saying it. Um, it's just an idea again of see it as you would speak to a friend or a colleague. It's a conversation. It would be rude if you give it instructions and just walk away, you'd lose friends that way. So then you can also use it just as a, I want to say free Grammarly, your um, your spell checker and your grammar checker and language uh, for short. What am I looking for? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, make your language pretty. <laughs> it's a language checker. So I wrote this purposefully quite bad, but if you copy and paste this into ChatGPT or any other um, AI platform it will fix it to you if you tell it to improve it. You can also then instruct it to rewrite it and in a formal tone. Yes, sir. And there, I think I think we can we can if Bard is still working, we can use some one or two of these prompts in Bard as well, because Bard will be able to do something like that very well. Just to give them a sense of what it could of what it does look like when it's generating, because I know we have a lot of people on here based on the chat. I can see there's a lot of people on here who have used AI tools as well, but there's also a lot of people who haven't really seen this in action. Uh, something went wrong, but it's still experimental. That is the feedback I am getting. It's still the same thing. But it seems sometimes it gives you the answer. Yeah, but it is not giving to me now. See, it's running. Oh, look at that. So it has rewritten this horrible thing with to be and everything in it. I regret to inform you, I will be unable to attend tonight's function due to a work commitment, blah, blah, blah. And then what Bard does, ChatGPT doesn't do it unless you instruct it to. Here are the specific changes I made. So it'll actually tell you I changed this thing to that thing. I changed this thing to that thing, which is kind of nice if you want to nerd out about the changes. Um, but sometimes this is redundant for me. I just want to get my stuff done and that's it. So your eye just catches it in a different way. And then. But, I, but Andrea, I do think 
when you talk about it as a learning tool, not just as a tool that makes my life as oh, a teacher yeah. easier, that is incredibly useful. The fact that Absolutely. it's not actually just correcting, it's the difference between the teacher that grabs a red pen and just shows you what you did wrong or just gives you the tick or the cross and the teacher who basically highlights every single answer for you and explains to you in detail what yeah. everything single thing should change to. So it's basically yeah. a t the most dedicated and committed teacher on planet Earth. <laughs> yes, it is. And a very fast teacher if it wants to do the work. And now the last two things. Let's see if Bard is going to play along with this. I have actually done this. I have generated report card comments. Okay, fine. I didn't copy and paste them exactly as AI spat them out, but it, it literally cut about 80% of my work. Instead of going to write personalized comments for about mm, 80, 90 learners, I gave ChatGPT a lot of information and it just spat out um, some comments that were very much usable. So the prompt here was, I'm an English teacher for grade 11s and I need to write report card comments. Each comment needs to be two sentences long. And this is the thing I want to show you that for me is the most important. What do you need from me to write these comments? So this is now you engaging with a conversation with AI. What do you need from me? So every video that I watch, everything that I sort of read about AI prompt uh, engineering and prompt designing, it's about also asking AI to ask you questions. So here we have its response. So it needs a student name, uh, overall performance, so maybe a brief overview of the student's overall performance, strengths in English, areas of improvement, blah, 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 blah. So now I can go in here and type the student's name. Um, so let's say, uh, my nanny, um, uh, poor performance and uh, strengths in English, so he talks a lot. I suppose that's a strength. Uh, areas for improvement, um, Need to pay more attention in class. And number five, I'm going to ignore. Let's see what it does with that. Um, so this is actually a usable sentence. I think it seems like Yanni is facing some challenges in the academic performance, blah, blah, blah. So, okay, now it's just giving me advice on what I should do. So this works better in ChatGPT. Again, you need to play around with the prompt. It doesn't always just understand you, but this is the idea that you don't just give it instructions and then copy and paste whatever pops up, engage with it. Um, yeah, this definitely works better for me the way that I've done it in ChatGPT. Uh, again, I use BARD for other things and I haven't used it for report cards. I'll definitely look into it a bit more. And then emails in general. Let's check what BARD does with this prompt. It's basically a prompt just saying, write an email to my colleague telling her how much I appreciate her work ethic. Oh, come now, BARD, spill some at me. He doesn't want to blame. Like if you just slap it enough, it goes. Yeah, it seems if you if you ask it very nicely, then it does. ChatGPT is just ChatGPT is just refusing. I've tried it a hundred times. I've yeah. got a million empty chats now. But Bard yeah. at least seems a little bit nicer. Um, but one thing as this is this generating. This lovely email, by the way. Yeah. There we go. One thing as it is generating, I think it is really um, it's it's one of those cases of finding the tool that works for its purpose because there's a, there's, a, there's a number of things that bar does really really well and there's a number of things that chat gpt does really really well um but the only way you'll know is by exploring the ex, is exploring them and they kind of have a similar way about them the prompting thing and the reprompting and the giving it details and refining your prompt etc cetera, etc cetera. as and there's pointed out the prompt is the king um it's it's 
it is a case of the more you do it, the more used to it you become, the more aware of what it can do you also become. So that that whole that is one of the the, the, the key things that you need to take from the session is that experimenting and playing around with what it can do is the only way to learn what it could do for you. Yeah, absolutely. Your computer will not explode from this, maybe from something else, but not from playing around with AI. So now I want to adapt this email. I have this great email. I hope this email finds you well. I'm writing to express my sincere gratitude for your unwavering dedication and acceptable, uh, exceptional work ethic. But let's see what it does with this. Okay, let's beg it first. Let's see what happens. I'm just pressing submit the whole time. Nope, does not want to play along. Come on. Okay, so I've asked it to make it more sarcastic. I am writing to express my immense gratitude for your uncanny ability to produce mediocre work, <laughs> pretending to be a human dynamo. <laughs> your dedication to mediocrity, your willingness to excel at being underwhelming are truly commendable. <laughs> okay, that's brilliant. Okay, so what if I say make it ominous? Oh my goodness, I love the sarcastic one. Yaku, I think that was your your idea to make it sarcastic. And if we make it ominous. Um, I hope this email finds you well and still breathing after another day of your relentless work ethic. Oh my goodness. A concept that seems alien to most of our colleagues who approach every task with a sense of urgency that's only matched by your ability to procrastinate. So it's still being sarcastic. And it hasn't taken my ominous thing. Oh, goodness. OK. And then the last one, I'm not even going to try. I think Bard has given up on life, is make it silly. So you can try and play around with different atmospheres, different tones. I think this is also something that could make some teaching activities quite um, different, quite fun. Let's say you have a, a poem you're discussing. This is just off, off uh, from the hip. Yeah, I'm shooting from the hip. Is you have a, a sonnet. Um, shall I compare it to a summer's day? You copy and paste it into ChatGPT and you say, OK, rewrite this in a sarcastic tone or rewrite this in the persona of Snoop Dogg or whatever. And then just to get those creative juices flowing and allow learners to see the possibility of viewing a well-established and well-known literature text through a different lens. And maybe that opens up some possibilities to actually start engaging at the higher Bloom's cognitive uh, levels. I know this sounds a bit bizarre, but my brain is already going in two directions of how can you play around with it and not just utilize it for administrative uh, purposes for yourself, but actually utilize it in the classroom. So for the last bit of the session, I just want to go back to my slide here. Um, Jaco, did you want to say something? Yes, Andrea, I just wanted to... I just went back in my chat history and I noticed that some of the examples that we spoke about I've actually got in this. I just want to share my screen oh, yeah. and and just show sure. them one or two of the things that we that we mentioned, um, just so they can see what what it actually looks like when we do it that way around. So let me just right. So there you'll see the question that we that we um, pitched in the beginning, which is the whole explain osmosis question, um, and then it gave me the explanation of osmosis. Then a long one, I asked it to explain it to me like I'm a biochemistry major, which made it super complicated. And then this is the part that I think is really cool. When I am trying to explain something like osmosis in an incredibly simplified way, it does it very well. Sure. Imagine you have a special box and inside this box, there are tiny invisible water particles called molecules. Now these water molecules like to spread out and move around. But imagine there are also some little toy animals inside the box and they are not letting the water molecules move freely. So 
very cool way of actually showing how we can have different levels of explanation for our learners. And again, this is going to link to some of the latest stuff that we want to do in the series where we look at it as a, how do we use AI particularly to enhance teaching and how do we use it to enhance learning? Um, there was a question on the Afrikaans. So yeah, I just asked it, explained to me in Afrikaans and then it gave me an Afrikaans explanation. Like we all know, the Afrikaans translations are okay. They are always getting better. The Isikosa translations are less okay, but again, they are also getting better. The more it does it, the better it gets because AI is learning. It is slowly but surely it's building up its knowledge and understanding of translation as well. So there is the whole thing in, in um, Afrikaans. And then one other thing that we also spoke about, the um, figures of speech example. So yeah, I asked it to generate a lesson for me. Look at the... Uh, the lesson itself. You've got an icebreaker activity. You've got an introduction to figures of speech. Gives me the minutes. Tells me everything that I need to do. And then towards the end, when I asked it, so the third lesson will take place in a computer lab. Rewrite it like a computer lab, and then it goes and tells me exploring personification in the digital realm. Again, gives me a whole idea of how to do it. Importantly, it's not building the things for me. It's not doing the lesson for me. But based off of this. And something it took me the time it took to type that sentence. I'm going to get some really, really good ideas. And to bring it exactly back to what Andrea was talking about in the beginning, it's like talking to a colleague. It's the same concept as the two of us sitting, having a chat and asking, so Andrea, what do you think? I've got a computer lab I can use in the third period. How will I, how will I do this? I'm not going to do every single thing that she tells me to do nor is she going to build all the resources that I can use, but she'll give me good ideas and she'll give me good advice and things that I can then decide to use and integrate the way that I want to use and integrate it. Um, I wanted to, here's a great sci seven science questions. So here again, multiple choice, it's generating multiple choice things. Just a little trick, we will, in, in our other sessions, we're going to show you how I can take that Turn it into a copyable thing you can just easily export into our various gamification tools. So that's a trick we'll show you at the later stage, but not now yet. Um, just wanted to show you what it looks like when it is generating, those of you who haven't used this yet. And all of this is based on super short sentences I've asked it to generate things for me. Right. And then I just wanted to show them that quickly because I've got those prompts in the background. So. I'm cool. Glad Thank you very you much for that. I'm I'm glad you had it in the background there. So for the last few minutes of the session, I just want to go back to um, our presentation because obviously we didn't get to what was really planned, and then we apologise for that. But hey, America is waking up, so let them do their thing. Transformative teaching and learning. We will delve into this when we develop, hopefully develop modules that will add on to this introduction to the idea of AI. Um, and I'm very glad to see, I've just checked the chat quickly, to see how many people have actually engaged with AI and that are not afraid of it. Um, yeah, it's really exciting. So the thing is, we see this thing as it's going to take away our jobs. Yes, we've spoken to people at the Braai about this. It's going to take away our jobs. It's going to kill education as we know it. Learners are going to cheat. Um, yes, it is, and yes, they do. It is going to take away our jobs. It is going to kill education as we know it. Thank goodness. And yes, learners have been cheating, and they will always find shortcuts. But, but... Generative AI brings with it the potential to make us the most efficient we've ever been at executing uh, an inefficient ex education system. This is a quote I got from Yaku. This is a tool that can optimize the way that we do things, optimize teaching and learning. So when I say it is going to take away our jobs, yes, just like the first industrial revolution and the second one and the third one and the fourth one, and we're going into the fifth one soon, it took away the majority of jobs probably, but with it came a bunch of new jobs that no one even knew would actually be possible. 
So yes, it's going to take away our jobs. It's going to, to destroy and to eliminate education as we know it because education needs to move forward. Yeah, learners are going to cheat. People are always looking for shortcuts. The fix does not lie with us going, well, here's a pencil and paper there. You know, we're just, we're going the thrones, phones away and we're just going back to, I don't know, fax machines and DOS. We can't do that. It's inefficient. So the thing is, AI brings with it the potential to completely disrupt and reshape, reshape education for the better. We can optimize our workload, our teaching and learning uh, support material, the, the pedagogies, teaching strategies. It's about how we explore this and how we embrace it. Up until now, Google has been able to satisfy the bottom levels of Bloom's um, taxonomy. So basically remembering and understanding, but with AI, are we surely not then able to utilize and explore level three and four, which is applying and analyzing. So engaging critical thinking, becoming creative, um, and constructing our own understanding of the world around us and not just um, rote, uh, applying rote learning and memorization. So it's engaging that aspect of critical thinking. And I think if anything, it is important for us as teachers, as policy makers, as other stakeholders to go, you know what? Humans will always need humans. It is up to us to make ourselves valid because that, I think, is the, the, the foundation of the fear is, oh, my goodness, the machines are going to take over. Yeah, they are. But it doesn't mean that we will become redundant. Only if we see ourselves that way do we become redundant. Humans, have, humans need humans. And that is just the baseline of our existence. And that is pretty much what we have time for. I think one minute to spare. Yaku, if you want to say something as a wrap up, you are more than welcome to. Thanks, Andrea. You had lots of um, cheers and lots of little hearts and things there. As we all saw now that, unfortunately, we weren't able to show you, well, we were able to show you some of what BARD can do and some of what, not what ChatGPT can do, but, I think the bottom line is just to emphasize what Andrea said there is um, when when you look at the when she was talking about Gen Z and we talk about the 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 digital natives and we talk about the 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 whole changing shifting landscape that we are teaching in, we have to be mindful of the fact that we need to change. We have to adapt. It's the whole in the whole revolution thing, adapt or die. And AI is that in all likelihood going to be that big wave. And the, the the main thing that I hope everyone has taken away from this is A, don't be scared and B, go and explore and play around with it and see what it can do for you. The way that I use AI to make my life more efficient is not gonna be the same as the way that you use AI. And I can't tell you how to use AI, but again, you'll never find out how, how you can use it and what it can do before you explore it. So. Again, today's session was more of an introduction to it, was more of a, um, hopefully a Kickstarter for your own exploration. And when we delve into the next episodes, we're really going to get into the, so here are a couple of cool, useful tips and tricks that you can just use to take it to the next level. And we and, and Andrea's also gonna show you some of the ways that she's used it. We will show you some ways that other teachers are using it just to inspire you into, into moving forward in this realm of AI so that you have something so that, so that we aren't left behind as things are moving forward. Absolutely. Thank you, Yaku. And thank you everyone for your afternoon and your time and your enthusiasm for furthering education and supporting our learners in this uh, challenging industrial revolution and all that. Thank you very much, everyone.